On this episode of Doing the Most, our first in a series of intros to all grain brewing, this is my first solo brew. Moment brews and various artists, everything from me to rose. Big creation, fermentation, and heat creation, doing the most. Now, I know what you may be thinking, and I know what I was thinking when I first thought about all grain brewing. It is complicated. There's a lot of gear. There is a lot of lingo to learn. And it just seems really complex and intimidating. And honestly, it kind of is. But don't, don't let that deter you. I'm here to make this as digestible and simple as possible. I've watched a lot of all grain brewing videos on YouTube. There are several YouTube channels that I recommend for their beer brewing expertise. But the thing that was lacking for me is that I felt like I needed a little bit of handholding to learn it. And so I got some. I had Anna's dad and uncle both separately teach me how to do all grain beer brewing. And uh, then I decided to brew my first solo brew. If you watch All Grain Beer Brewing on YouTube, a lot of times you're gonna see brew in a bag. We are not doing that in this video, but I will do a separate video on brew in a bag and that is coming up soon. So in All Grain Brewing, there is a lot of lingo and a lot of gear and I felt like it would be only appropriate to just go ahead and run you through the lingo and gear. So that way you'll a little bit be familiar with it as we move forward through this video. I wanna take you through what I believe to be the six kind of main steps on your way to brewing and drinking your first all grain batch. Those are your prep, mash, sparge, boil, pitch, and packaging. But before we get to those six steps, let's do a quick gear rundown. This is all the gear that you're gonna see used in this video. Stir plate, grams scale, grain mill, mash tun with false bottom five gallon pot, brew kettle, propane burner and regulator, and tank. Hops spider, mash paddles, <laughs> instant read thermometer, some kind of table, work chiller with garden hose and adapter, and hoses for transfer. Now, you may see another couple pieces of gear in there, but if you follow our channel and you brew by our processes, I'm sure you've seen or have those other pieces of gear already, like a brewing bucket. So all that said, let's take a look at our recipe. The ingredients for our 90 minute Nelson IPA are five gallons of water for the mash, 3.125 gallons of water for the sparge, 11 pounds of raw two row, one pound of carapils, 12 ounces of caramel 60L, and eight ounces of Nelson Sauvin hops. Those hops are gonna be added at a rate of 2.5 grams every single minute for an entire 90 minute boil. Our yeast for this IPA is going to be Verdant IPA Ale Yeast. We begin 24 hours before brew day making a yeast starter. Now, there are a lot of different ways to make a yeast starter, but for this video, we wanted to show you how to do a starter using a stir plate. This stir plate was sent to us by our friends over at Northern Brewer. Big shout out to them for always supporting the channel. You really should check them out, check out their website. They've got a ton of cool stuff, big selection, and they have some really cool gear. So check them out, especially if you're getting into beer brewing. They have a great selection of hops and grains and all that. And they actually came up with the grain bill and sent over the grain for this recipe. So thank you, Northern Brewer. So we start by making a little bit of wort with just a little bit of dry malt extract and some boiled water. And once that little bit of wort cools down, we fill up our flask to 650 milliliters. And you'll note that the little stir bar is there in the bottom of the flask already. We are using an ale yeast called Verdant IPA. It was actually recommended to me by the local homebrew shop and that just goes right in dry. And then I put my foam stopper on top to keep any bugs out and get this thing started. And uh, Anna's little cousin <laughs> helped me <laughs> a little bit. And uh, this was kind of tricky and I thought I was doing it wrong and then I realized that the stir bar just hadn't really caught on the magnet properly. So you really wanna kind of jiggle it around until the stir bar sets on top of that magnet and then it'll spin up just properly. 
So I kind of fidgeted with it and uh, fought with it for a minute until I realized that it was absolutely human error. And once I got it figured out, I went ahead and set it for 12 hours, knowing that I was probably gonna come in and add a little time to it the next day. And I think in total, I didn't do this for a full 24 hours. It was more like 20 hours, but it was definitely quite active when it went into my work. You don't need a stir plate to do a yeast starter, but it sure does help. And the way it primarily helps is by skipping the lag phase that you would typically experience when brewing. That first 24 hours where the yeast colony is establishing itself and kind of getting up to speed. If you start your yeast starter 24 hours ahead of time and you use a stir plate to get it nice and well aerated, by the time you're ready to pitch your yeast 24 hours later, it will have already gone through the lag phase process, so you are pitching a very healthy and robust colony right into your beer. Other ways of starting a yeast starter might be to rehydrate your yeast if you're using dry yeast with a little bit of Go Firm Protect. That kind of gives it all the nutrients it needs as it rehydrates, it sucks up all that good stuff so it's kind of ready to go out of the gate. Or sometimes you might just draw off some of your must with a sanitized wine thief or turkey baster and rehydrate or mix in your liquid yeast in that for 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, just to get everything kind of homogenous and then pitch it in from there. However, I wanted to show the stir plate because it's really doing the most and it's a fun piece of tech to play with. What I recommend everyone use a stir plate for their starters? Maybe not, but if you can, you should because it's fun and it's super effective. As brew day started, I did a little cleaning and set up. This little guy here goes in the bottom of the brew kettle and uses capillary action to help pull from the bottom of the brew kettle. I did a little testing to make sure I had a decent seal on it and kind of clean everything out in the bottom there. This was a fresh tank, so I had to get my regulator hooked up to my burner, get everything sealed and secure. And then the water for my mash goes in. Here we started with five gallons of water for the mash. We'll also be using about three and one eighth gallons of water to sparge. So you've got your strike water, and your water that you're going to sparge with, or your liquor, your hot water. How do you know how much of that to use? It's important to understand that your grist or your grain is going to soak up some of your water. So a lot of brewers will start with one to two quarts of water per pound of grist. For this IPA, we didn't have a lot of grain in here. So we went ahead and went with an average of about one and a half quarts per pound of grain, and that put us at around five gallons of strike water. So then when it comes to sparging, you also have to recall that that grain is gonna soak up some liquid, about a pint per pound. So you wanna run a calculation, like the one here on the screen, to calculate for how much water you're gonna need for the sparge. And you're gonna to wanna to prepare just a little bit more than you need in case you need it. So running the calculation and kind of figuring on how much liquid our grain absorbed, we ended up going with three and one eighths gallon of sparge water. And again, here are the calculations in case you wanna screenshot this for how much water you're going to need for both your mash, your strike water, and for your sparge. So as you can see, in total, we had over eight gallons of water that we used to get to about five and a half to six gallons of wort by the time we got to our mash. Once all that was in, I got my gas going and lit my burner and we're bringing this water up to about 170, 172 Fahrenheit. And that should be a good strike temp for our grain to go in. My grain mill setup is a little bit different from others you may see on the YouTubes. Typically others will drill a hole in a piece of wood and mount their grain mill to that and set it on top of a bucket. I happen to have a bunch of honey buckets lying around from my mead making, so I just cut a hole in the top of a honey bucket lid and mounted my grain mill to that. That way it secures tightly on the top of my bucket and I don't lose any grain because it falls right into the bucket. While the water's heating up, we've got to mill our grain. Now, all of this grain came milled from Northern Brewer, which is great. I wanted to run it through my grain mill for one, to show you what that looks like, and for two, just to ensure I had a nice consistent milling. When you have your grain milled at your local homebrew store, you can actually ask them to mill it twice. And if you don't like how coarse the milling is, you can actually have them dial in the mill to make it just a little bit of a finer milling. First, these small bags of grain go in. The carapils is mainly for head retention. And then the Caramel 60L is in there for some flavor. Get all that milled up and it goes right into the bucket. And then we start adding all of our two row in here. 
and uh, we'll have to mill this in a few different batches. So that takes a little bit of time, enough time at least for our water to come up to temperature. Why do we mill grain? Well, so we can get a little bit better efficiency out of it. All those starches and sugars are locked up inside of those grain kernels. So crushing them just a little bit exposes more surface area. However, you don't wanna crush them up too fine because the husks on the outside can become acrid if you uh, grind them up too much and extract too much tannin out of those. I like a kind of medium mill on my grain. And once our water is up to temperature, it's time to get that water into our mash tun. My mash tun here has a false bottom in it that helps separate the grain bed from the liquid so you can transfer from underneath the grain bed and not get a bunch of grain into your brew kettle. Of course, on the outside, I've got that spigot. Once the water is up to strike temp, we are going to shut off the gas and quickly transfer it to the mash tun and mix it with the grain at the same time. So that way we can retain as much of the heat in here as possible. Adding the grain to that hot water is gonna drop the temperature some and we're hoping to nail a temperature between 155 and 159 or so. And that should be a great temperature for mash and get us some pretty good sugar extraction out of here. And after all that mixing, we landed with a mash temp of 157. So we will put our lid on top of the mash tun and let that sit for one hour. So what happens in a mash? Well, you've got some enzymes in there that come naturally with the grains, like alpha amylase and beta amylase. And those enzymes go in there and cleave off parts of the starches, converting them into fermentable sugars. So we're hoping that those enzymes that work in very specific temperature ranges during that hour long mash convert starches into sugars, which we can convert into alcohols and have a nice, tasty, boozy beer on the other end. And a little bit more setup takes place. We've got to get a table of sorts here. I don't have a table, but these sawhorses and boards work well. And we'll also get some hoses and things attached. Here is our wort chiller. This hooks up to the garden hose and the cold water running through that really conductive copper will help rapidly chill our wort down to yeast pitching temperature. So I just made sure to get everything on there really tight with hose clamps, good and secure. So that way I had no leaks. And then about halfway through the mash, I went ahead and got my sparge water into the brew kettle. So that way I could start heating that up to a similar mash temperature. Once the mash is complete, we need to set our grain bed. And we're gonna do that by doing something that's called a Vorloff. And basically what that means is we are going to circulate our wort from the bottom of the mash tun to the top very gently so the grain bed sets really nice and you'll know that's done when it starts to flow kind of clear out of the other end and then you can transfer that off to your brew kettle so it takes a couple vessels to do this and you kind of want to minimize your oxygen contact while you're doing this so you just want to be really gentle and kind of pour down the sides of your container and just repeat and repeat and repeat with those two vessels until it starts to run clear. Once that grain bed is set, we'll transfer off the water we're gonna to use to sparge into this other kettle. We'll do that very quickly. And that water is about 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we will run the liquid from our mash down into the bottom of the brew kettle. Once that transfer is complete, we are going to batch sparge. There are a couple different ways of sparging. The batch sparge is, in my opinion, the simplest because it requires the least amount of extra tech and gear. And basically you heat up your sparge water and then carry it up the ladder and dump it in. Easy as that. 
So that's going to obviously disturb the grain bed. So we're gonna to need to do another round of Vorloff to make sure our grain bed gets set. And once that runs clear, we're ready to add that to the brew kettle as well. So all of that goes in with the initial mash and that should bring us up to about five and a half, six gallons or so. And factor that a lot of that is also going to boil off during our 90 minute boil, big boil on this. So our heat goes back on, our grain goes into the compost heap, which Anna so lovingly raked in with all the other debris that we had added in the last few days to our compost heap. Just making dirt, you know. And this is a good time while your boil is heating up to kind of clean all your stuff. So our hop spider goes in as the boil gets close to boiling. That'll help sanitize it and get us ready for all of our 90 hop additions. Since we have a half a pound of hops that are going to go in here over 90 minutes, I went ahead and weighed out a bunch of batches of two and a half grams. At that rate of about two and a half grams per hop addition, once per minute, we'll use up the whole half pound of hops. And then we started. And every minute for 90 minutes, I added two and a half grams of hops. And you can kind of track the pace of that as you watch the sun move across the brew kettle in this shot. I used my Kindle as a clock so I knew every minute when to run over to the brew kettle. And that went on and on and on for 90 full minutes. This hop schedule is very atypical from what you would usually see in a beer recipe. Usually you're gonna do three, four, maybe five hops additions throughout a one hour boil. And that is more common and less unusual and taxing than what we did here, but I really wanted to do the most and see what we could get extracting the whole character of that Nelson hop from beginning to end, every little thing that we might wanna extract out of there over that whole 90 minutes. However, usually you're gonna see something like this. Hops at the beginning, at the start of that one hour boil, maybe some aromatic hops about halfway through, maybe a different aromatic hop with 15 minutes to go, and sometimes you'll even have some hops at flame out. Also in some styles, you may have a dry hop that happens in the carboy or in the keg, and that's just a way to get a little bit more of a hops profile, maybe something that you're really searching for right there toward the end. At 15 minutes to go, I added a Whirlflock tablet. It's a little tablet made of Irish moss that helps the beer clear. And then I also put in my wort chiller, a nice 15 minute boil, make sure that's sanitized. And I hooked it up to the garden hose. And I continued with a couple more hops additions right up into the end. Then I drained the wort off of the hops. Look at all those hops. I ended up just sitting it on top of the wort chiller to finish draining. And then turned on the garden hose so we can start running cold water through the wort chiller. And it takes about 20 to 25 minutes of running the water to get it down to temperature. And as you can see here, we had gotten it down to 87 degrees, which is a good time to start running it into our sanitized brewing bucket. And that just trickles in, it takes a little bit of time. You wanna make sure to keep that covered if you've got flies around, which we did. Don't want any bad buggies getting in there. Once it was close to done transferring, I pulled the wort chiller out of there and went ahead and tipped the brew kettle forward. So that way I could make sure I got every last drop that I could. Easy as that. Grabbed my yeast starter. I went ahead and used this little magnetic tool they sent along with this kit to get my stir rod out of the bottom hate for that to fall right into the brewing bucket and then poured in my yeast starter to get this thing going and this was so foamy and so active when it went in which was kind of fun to see there was like no lag phase it just immediately went into action in the wort which was pretty cool and a quick check of the refractometer and hydrometer put us at 1.070 airlock goes on Perfection. This is like right where I want it to be. And just an hour later, I've got crazy, crazy bubble action already happening in the brew bucket. Love it. And that's basically it. Once that was done, about seven days later, it went into a sanitized keg. 
and I put that keg into my keyser under 30 PSI for about 24 hours and then for the next couple days had it set on serving pressure which is about 10 12 PSI and uh, that got it carbonated up and ready to go easy as that grain to glass in about nine days All right, so we're here with David, and we are going to try the 90-minute IPA that we made in this video. And uh, I want to like reiterate that this is not like I'm not releasing my recipe for how to do the best 90-minute IPA. This is this is entirely a how to do all grain brewing simplified kind of video. But uh, big shout out again to Northern Brewer for sending over the grain for this and for sending over the stir plate for this video. Appreciate y'all, I'm gonna be using that stir plate a lot coming up in the future for yeast starters. But this is the IPA. Okay. There's a half a pound of Nelson hops in here. One okay. of the most, sometimes most hard to get your hands on hops. Leet. Uh, from New Zealand. And it was added at a rate of 2.5 grams every minute for 90 minutes, totaling that full uh, half pound. So, okay. cheers. Hmm. The whole hop profile is Nelson. Uh -huh. Whereas in a lot of IPAs, you'll have various different hops for different purposes, like bittering, aroma, dry hopping at the end for like big aromas. But everything happened in the brew kettle and everything happened with the single hop varietal. This is an interesting IPA. Yeah. I it's mean, not it, as bitter as you would expect. No, it's it? not as bitter. It's a little, little smoother than what I would traditionally consider, I guess, an IPA. Um, Talk to me about the hops, though. They're definitely there. Um, they're up front, kind of go away, and then kind of come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like, a- That's very interesting. There's like a, a sweet malty dip in the middle, yeah. and then you come back to the hops. It's a nice yeah. wave. There's something going on in here, though. I can't quite put my finger on it. Yeah, I was telling him before we started that there's something in here that I noticed that I think is a yeast contribution. And I was curious if he could pick up on it too. I mean, yeah, I can. <laughs> if I say the word out loud, I think you'll you'll okay. go. Oh, that's it. Uh, but what I pick up from the hops is there's there's big fruit flavors. Oh yeah. There's a lot of grapey whininess, mm -hmm. and that's what they. It's called Nelson Sauvin because it's like a Sauvignon Blanc wine grape is okay. where you get a lot of those different things. But there's some stone fruit stuff going on in there, mm -hmm. and to, for me, I, I almost a little bit. It's got like a fruit loopy flavor, but that's not the that's not the character I'm going to talk to. I was going to say I'm not. I don't. But really taste get it fruit again. Loops. Okay. It's a little bit got like a like a General Mills fruity cereal kind of flavor. Just a little thing hanging out in there. Yeah, and it's kind of up front, right? Is that where you're getting that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right at the beginning, right as you right as you go into the swallow. It kind of tastes like Crispix or Crispix or yeah, whatever Yeah, there's, there's some cereal grain yeah. kind of. So the flavor that I pick up in here is just in the mid palate, you were talking about how the hops dip mm -hmm. and then come back, mm -hmm. where you get that punch of sweetness, I pick up just a little bit of banana in there. Just a little bit, like a Hefeweizen kind of banana. Yeah, you're right. Like a banana peel. Yeah. yeah. And once you start like tasting for it, it's hard to avoid. Yeah, I kind of wish you wouldn't have said that, actually. <laughs> I yeah. kind of like, I kind of like, I mean, I, I like this. This is not bad by any means. Oh, like, it's so, it's such it's, a smooth drinker. It's really easy to drink. It's such a smooth drinker. Probably dangerous for you. Mm, yeah. Having that readily on tap, mm. 37 degrees. Mm. I do like it. It's, it's an interesting IPA. I yeah. will say that because like I said, I mean, harsh probably isn't the right word, but a lot of IPAs, let's say are very bright, mm -hmm. like very, very bright. This is not. Yeah. It's yeah. there, but it's way more subtle than what I consider a more traditional or, I mean, what are IPAs now? What is a traditional IPA these days? Feels like everybody models their IPA off of the one from Lagunitas. It seems like everybody yeah. wants to be adjacent to that IPA. I could see that. No, um, this is, I mean, crushable. Like, it's, it's fruity. It's like a it's, crushable IPA. <laughs> yeah, it's fruity and it's weird. smooth. And I think part of that crushability is that it's not super bitter. 
And right. Now, I think if I was going to do this again, I wouldn't do it as a 90 minute IPA, even though it was a really fun exercise. I would probably hit it, I'd probably do it for 60 minutes. I'd probably hit it with Centennial or Cascade up front for uh -huh. bittering. And then I'd probably still stick to the half a pound of Nelson, but probably do it at five minute increments instead gotcha. of one minute increments. Because I don't, I don't know that that really like really brought some mind blowing uh, yeah. thing to it, but. I mean, at the end of the day, this is good. Yeah, it's hella good. It's quite tasty. And this was a uh, grain to glass in about eight, nine days. Wow. Yeah, totally skipped secondary. Just went right from primary into the keg. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Super good, very unusual, and I learned a lot for damn sure. Well, my, cheers to that. My first solo brew. Cheers. Y'all, I'm trying to shoot a, I'm trying to shoot a video here. It's called, it's called doing the most. You ever heard of it? Okay, it's your show now.